Welcome everybody to That's Entertainment by Coastal Profit Participation Disputes in Film and Other Entertainment Deals. Uh, my name is Barry Chase. I'm the CLE Director at the New York County Lawyers Association. And we're very happy to welcome you to um, the third program in the series that we've done with the Beverly Hills Bar Association. And we're very excited about this program. Um, before you begin, we begin, I just have a few CLE announcements and I'll try to do them as quickly as possible because we have a lot to cover. Um, first of all, if you've registered with the Beverly Hills Bar Association, uh, you'll be receiving an email within 24 hours with your, with your certificates. If you've registered with NYCLA, by next week, you'll get an email from us with the link for where you can download New York and New Jersey certificates. And that link is also in an email that our registrar, Amelia Brzezinski, sent out 30 minutes ago. Uh, speaking of CLE certificates, if anybody in California wants a New York certificate or anyone in New York wants a California certificate, please send an email to cle at nycla.org. Again, that's cle at nycla.org indicate your name, your email address, and which certificate that you'd like. And we'll put that in the chat in a few minutes so that you'll be able to um, have it as well for reference. Um, also, there are excellent course materials and the link to the course materials are in your Zoom invitations. And also at the end of the program, you'll be prompted with a survey and we'd appreciate um, any feedback that you would give us. And finally, we are trying to make this as interactive as possible. So if you do have any questions for our speakers, please put them in the Q&A box, which is on your Zoom uh, toolbar. Please don't put them in the chat box as we use that for more general information. And we'll be monitoring the Q&A box and we'll get to the questions as many as we can at the end of the program. Um, I'd like to thank um, the staff of the Beverly Hills Bar Association who have been fantastic in helping us put together this program. I'd also like to thank uh, Hillary Johns, the entertainment section of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, um, Robert Kellner, who is a longtime member of MICLA, who helped us to put this program together as well. And um, of course, I want to thank all of our speakers and our wonderful moderator, Alexander Rufus Isaacs. Um, and he is a he is an attorney who began his career in England. He moved to the United States uh, to Los Angeles and was admitted to the California Bar. He is a litigator with an emphasis on business, defamation, and entertainment disputes. And I'm going to turn the program over to him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. My name, as uh, uh, Barry just mentioned, is Alexander Rufus Isaacs, and I will be your moderator for today's program. Uh, this is a program which is aimed to explain some differences between the law and practice in New York and California concerning profit participation oh, yes. and also the parole evidence rule. Um, one housekeeping note before I proceed, uh, it may be of interest to you, uh, Ken Ziffron, who is a very well-known entertainment lawyer here in Los Angeles, is doing, I believe, his 13th or 14th annual address on the entertainment industry on August the 25th. A link will be going up in chat, highly recommended, and uh, I hope you can make that. Uh, we've dealt, I think, with all of the other issues I will be monitoring questions and uh, we will answer as many as we can at the end, but we've got a lot to get through. Um, this is another in the series of programs jointly organized by NYCLA and the BHBA, uh, but is the first to address issues of interest to entertainment lawyers. And because it's a comparative law program, the difficulty we faced was that there are so many similarities between the law of both states in this area. And the task had been to identify differences which are significant not only in principle, but also more importantly, in practice. Most of us are very familiar with the law of our home state, but it normally requires either an in-depth knowledge of the law of the other state or a case where conflict has been highlighted to find an imperative, uh, important comparative difference. Um, I might add at this stage that if anybody has any suggestions for any future programs, uh, please let me know. I'm going to put my email address up in the chat box, and uh, we're always looking for good topics to explore in future programs. 
Uh, I pin the blame for identifying the subject of today's webinar firmly on Benny, Bonnie Eskenazi. <laughs> uh, Bonnie's a partner at Greenberg Glasgow LLP here in LA. She is consistently recognized as one of the most prominent entertainment lawyers in Hollywood and regularly handled some of Hollywood's most high profile and landmark entertainment disputes. She teaches a course in entertainment law at Stanford Law School and is an annual guest lecturer at Harvard Law School. And her passion for advancing the careers of women led her to join the board of Women in Film and to create and launch its sexual harassment helpline, which includes a pro bono legal aid panel in addition to therapeutic assistance for survivors of sexual harassment in the entertainment industry. Dorothy Weber is a partner at Herbsman, Haffer, Weber and Frisch LLP in New York. She has a litigation practice specializing in intellectual property and has handled a number of seminal Second Circuit decisions dealing with copyright and trademark issues, as well as participating in the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision of Eldred versus Ashcroft on copyright term extension by filing an amicus brief on behalf of Amsong, whose members include the estates of Frank Lusser and the estate of Hoagie Carmichael. Her practice also includes extensive IP licensing activities for merchandise, film and fashion, as well as mergers and acquisitions involving internet companies. She's lectured widely on copyright and trademark issues and is the author of numerous articles in the IP field, including in the Visual Artist Manual, the New York Law Journal, and the Cardozo Entertainment Law Review. Uh, Bruce Isaacs was formerly one of the best known entertainment litigators in LA and is currently a full-time mediator and arbitrator with signature resolution. He settled a wide range of cases, including copyright, entertainment, trademark, right of publicity, music, contracts, real estate insurance, and other matters. He's greatly respected by both plaintiffs and defense counsel, and Bruce resolves extremely complex uh, disputes, the combination of excellent problem-solving skills, consistent follow-up, and deep subject matter expertise. So with that, we're going to start the substance of the program and Bonnie is going to kick it off by telling us a little bit about the principles of California law and so far as they affect profit participation. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. So in California in the early to mid 1980s, there was quite a, um, uh, a controversy about creating tort damages for contract law. Uh, and it began with a, a California Supreme Court case called Siemens in 1984, which established a cause of action for bad faith denial of the existence of a contract. And that really opened up a vociferous debate in California uh, about the importance of distinguishing between contract and tort claims. Almost immediately, there was a, a major pushback by judges in California on the tortification of contract claims. And eventually, 11 years later, in 1995, a case called Freeman and Mills overruled Siemens. The reason this is important is because in profit participations, what we see frequently is the part, profit participants attempting to tortify contract, what are basically contract claims. Um, and, and they do it really, the two most common ways of doing it is number one, uh, uh, alleging a fraud cause of action, number two, a breach of fiduciary duty cause of action. And that's both in California and New York. So let me talk a little bit about the law in California under uh, both of those legal theories. First of all, fraud. So many, many profit participation cases contain an allegation of fraud. And in California, theoretically at least, California allows such claims on a profit participation breach of contract case. But two words of caution. First, remember that there's a heightened pleading requirement for fraud. Now, that's not usually a problem in a profit participation case because Typically, you have an audit which precedes the cause of actions being filed. Um, so usually you have a lot of detail. The second issue is what's called the economic loss rule here in California, which says you can't recover tort damages for a breach of contract. However, every person in California is bound to refrain from harming the property or person of another, even without a contract. So the, the duty to avoid 
lying in the context of, of, of any contractual obligation is a duty that's separate from contract. And it constitutes an exception to the economic loss rule. So that if the breach is accompanied by a fraud, a, a, a means used to either breach the contract or to induce the contract, it constitutes an exception to, to, the, uh, to the economic loss rule. However, there is also a, a requirement that you allege some additional harm above and beyond just the underpayment of royalties. Some courts have accepted out-of-pocket expenses to discover the fraud as the additional harm. Um, and, and typically, that will get you past a demur. However, you need to focus on this kind of issue, damages and additional damages um, it, in order to get past a summary judgment motion because courts are a little bit all over the place when it comes to summary judgment motions in this area. One of the biggest issues that that the, the plaintiffs will have to get over is differentiating between the concept of fraudulent a fraudulent accounting method versus one about which the parties simply differ in their opinions. Um, so now, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm just going to move quickly on to breach of fiduciary duty, which generally in California is not available in connection with a profit participation claim. There was an old line of cases going back to the very early 1900s uh, where sharing a, a financial interest in real property or patents, along with sharing profits in that property, imposed a fiduciary duty on the party with control over the property. The courts deemed those kinds of agreements as joint ventures or partnerships, which is a matter of law here in California imposes a, a fiduciary duty. But starting with the Wolf case, Wolf versus Superior Court, in, in 2003, the courts really began turning away from that concept. Uh, uh, Gary Wolf was a rights holder, a novelist uh, for, the, for the film called Who Framed Roger Rabbit? And essentially, he was suing not only for suing Disney, not only for breach of contract, but he sued for a breach of fiduciary duty. And in that case, the court held that an entitlement to future compensation even when that future compensation is when the, within the exclusive control of the other party, doesn't make that a fiduciary duty in the absence of other indicia of a confidential relationship. Now that came up on Demur. And in that case, uh, Wolf admitted that this wasn't a joint venture or a partnership and he couldn't amend to state facts alleging such a relationship. And one of the major factors that the courts looked at is that Disney could choose to exploit the property or not at all. As we all know, in the entertainment field, most contracts for in entertainment say that the studio has the right to either exploit or not exploit. And usually a fiduciary has an obligation to maximize profits for the person whom he or she owes the fiduciary duty to. Um, there was a dissent in that case in which uh, the court... <laughs> The dissenting judge said, well, I, I, I get it that, you know, that they can decide to exploit or not exploit. But once they decide to exploit, don't they have the same obligations as any other fiduciary to maximize the profits? And the dissent even talked about, at least in here in California, how accountants are fiduciaries to their clients. So essentially, that was a concept that that has been talked about. And in the case of Celador versus Disney, which also came up in the context of a right holders, a rights holders profit participation, and also came up. It was in federal court, so it was a it was um, a motion to dismiss. Um, in that case, the plaintiffs really tried to and succeeded in. Uh, pleading around the concept of uh, no fiduciary duty. And they did that by alleging in the complaint that the relationship was akin to a joint venture. And in that, in the context of that pleading, they, they relied on the traditional elements of a joint venture here in California, which is a joint interest in a common business, which is always 
the case in a profit participation with an understanding to share profits and losses. And clearly, there's an understanding that profits would be shared in a profit participation case. But the third part, which is really critical if you're going to try to plead around a fiduciary duty um, a fiduciary duty bar here in California, is a right to joint control. That becomes a lot more difficult in profit participation cases. But in the Celador case, they talked about um, a reversionary right. They talked about merchandising rights. They talked about approvals and meaningful consultation rights. And that was enough to get them past the motion to dismiss because obviously the, the court had to take as true all of the allegations. Um, but again, said, emphasized that, that sharing of profits alone is not enough. And so the question here in California is you know, one of the questions, if you want to try to get around the what has been deemed basically a, a bar to fiduciary duty allegation, fiduciary duty claims in the context of a breach of contract action, is really, you know, would the Celador case apply to other non-rights holding talent, such as actors and directors who are merely apply, or merely supplying services and they're not actually sharing property as it were. The two cases where this has come up where, where they're trying to distinguish the old line of cases dealing with real property and patents really were rights holders where the rights holders were conveying property and essentially sharing that property with the studio. Um, in any case, the, that that's that's my ten minutes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on to the next person. <laughs> Sorry, I was talking so fast. I'm sure there'll be some questions. Um, no, that was great, Bonnie. Um, Dorothy, could you give us the New York perspective on this area? I'll I'll give the New York perspective, and I think kind of the practical application perspective. You know, once Bonnie, Bruce, and I get involved in things, and anyone who does litigation. The threshold question is interpretation of the contract. And of course, the interpretation of the contract is going to be governed by the substantive laws that are set forth in the contract. And New York and California, while very similar, do have certain substantive differences that you need to be aware of in drafting the agreements. Because at the end of the day, none of us want to have to be in a situation where when there's a problem with the contract, we're getting to the point of having to explain what the case law is and the hurdles that we're gonna to have to overcome to prove your case. And I think all of us, certainly early in my career, a lot of us learned these things the hard way. One of the first cases that I was involved with on an accounting provision was a case against PBS where there were you know, profit participation issues participation on net, you know, a very full definition of net, which talked about a lot of the things that Bonnie spoke about that you think would create at least a fiduciary relationship and the ability to get an accounting or audit. And after I filed the lawsuit to do that, I learned that in New York, unless you have a specific accounting provision, you have to prove a breach of fiduciary duty to get a full accounting. And, and that's a very, very important thing to know because that's one of the first things you wanna ensure you have in an agreement, whether it's in New York or California, you need to set forth the specific accounting provisions. In, addi in addition to the definitions of royalty and net and profit participation, you really do wanna flesh out what rights that gives your clients to go in and get an audit and get an accounting. Because again, no matter how good craftsmen we are in defining what profit participation is or net is, if you don't have those underlying tools to get the information, your, your only resort is to start a litigation. So you wanna make sure that in, in drafting the agreements, especially in New York, that you have very, very specific accounting and audit provisions. And I always say to people, you know, how complicated do these have to be? Well, you look at one of the most popular songs of ever, you know, Little Nas X um, and Young Kim 
with the Old Town Road. It was a $30 fee, all done online with the most simplistic contract imaginable. But there wasn't a problem with that. All of these issues arise when there's a problem. And all the old tropes about the contract is only as good as the two people who sign either side of it. You still, <clears throat> excuse me, need the tools to get your client the information. And that kind of applies across the board in music contracts, theater contracts, film contracts. You know, don't rely just on boilerplate. You know, Bruce, Bonnie, and I have dealt with so many litigations that relied on either old boilerplate, boilerplate that may have been bastardized in the, in the, the firm's templates. You really cannot just draft an agreement relying on what you think is standard boilerplate. I think the, the one thing that all of us concentrate on um, in dealing with New York and California practice when we're advising clients is as a generalized rule, California tends to be more artist friendly than New York. So if you're representing the artist, even if everybody is based in New York, you may wanna consider putting in California law. We do it all the time as a specifically negotiated provision. Clearly people who know the reason why I'm putting California law in will push back on that. But California is definitely, I find, more pro-artist, um, especially in, in federal court. And I assume the same is in California state court. For sure, in New York state court, New York is a business jurisdiction. It really looks at the four corners of the document. And it's very loath to start adding additional things that the parties should have thought of. Uh, thought about. Bruce is going to go into to the differences between parole evidence in New York and California. But again, I think our job is, as lawyers is to really avoid that situation. And again, it goes back to crafting the agreement as specifically and carefully and cleanly as you can, because you don't want to be in a situation where you have to be saying to a judge, well, what I thought this meant was, and in New York, you can't bring in parole evidence unless there's an ambiguity in the contract. The courts are very loath to go outside what they call the four corners of the agreement to start interpreting or giving meaning to what the clients meant. And again, this goes back to the importance of drafting because if there are ambiguous terms, that's gonna bring a court into deciding what the parties meant instead of letting the parties set forth what they mean in the agreement. So I can't stress how important it is that when you're drafting these provisions to keep the litigation part of it and the case law part of it as much out of your agreement as you can because again, clients, especially you know, young clients, don't have the resources to start fighting these things in court. And you want to be able to ensure that you've got as bulletproof an agreement as you can, because you don't want a judge deciding what you meant. And if you're in New York, the judge is going to be very, very loath to start trying to give equitable relief where equitable relief is not available. And as Bonnie pointed out, once you get into the issue of whether or not a fiduciary relationship exists, in, in pleading a fiduciary relationship, it's a much higher burden in New York. You have to allege and prove why it's a fiduciary relationship. In the PBS case, just the fact that they had a venture, the fact that they were doing a documentary, the fact that they had certain obligations to the artist, it didn't rise to the level of fiduciary relationship. And without an accounting provision, the accounting cause of action failed. Now, what does that mean as a practical matter? It meant that there was gonna be a lot more work and cost to the client because yes, you can get these documents in discovery. 
because there's a net provision in the agreement that's going to require the turnover of documents. But if you've gotten to that point, your client has already spent more in legal fees than they may have earned under the contract in total. So when you have wealthy clients deciding contractual issues and you're up against big studios, you know, that, that's what keeps all of us in business, but it's certainly not what's going to help young artists and people, you know, less and less want to be at the forefront of making case law and spending the legal fees to do that. So I find it's really, really important. Everything starts literally from the ground up and the drafting is so critical in these kinds of agreements. And again, you know, the little Nas X is, is one of my favorite examples, multi, multi-million dollars done on basically the back of a gum wrapper with $30 Venmo. But in the real world, if there's a problem, people are trying to pay as little as they can and artists are trying to get as much as they can. And the one thing that does help in New York to get around the strict contract interpretation mm -hmm is the cause of action that we have for implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing, which is very, very f fulsome law in New York. The courts are very, very happy to enforce that. And if somebody is trying to get out of their contractual obligations, the courts have no problem enforcing that implied covenant. But again, it's more important to have everything that you need in the contract rather than be arguing these issues before a judge and trying to, to, to find out what the contract meant. And again, as, as Bruce is gonna fill you in, you know, parole evidence isn't a sure thing. And it differs more, I think, on, yes, state laws a bit different in New York from California but I find so much of it then depends on the judge that you get. And, you know, in federal court, judges will for equitable relief fit square pegs in round holes, I think more. State court judges are less inclined to do that. But, you know, I always tell clients, you don't, you don't wanna have to have your fate sealed by a third party who wasn't involved in the contract. So my advice is always flesh out your deal, flesh out your contract negotiations. Don't just rely on boilerplate and really consider what venue you want to have the contract apply. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, before we, we go on to Bruce, who's gonna tell us, talk to us a little bit about uh, parole evidence. I'd just like to get Bonnie and Bruce's views on some of the um, statements that Dorothy was making. Um, uh, particularly with respect to her uh, perception that uh, California is a little more talent friendly. Um, do, do you have, do you get that idea that uh, we are more talent friendly than New York? Have you, has that been your experience over your careers? Yes, definitely. It has. And, and for just as an example, what, what um, Dorothy was saying about an accounting here in California, you can, an accounting cause of action is going to hold, even if it's not written in the contract. So you will get that accounting cause of action. The other issue is, even though in the Wolf case, they found that there wasn't a breach of fiduciary duty claim because the parties were not fiduciaries. One of the arguments that the plaintiff in that case made was that um, that because Disney had all of the information, it, it essentially is holding that information in trust and it's all in secret. And therefore, um, there should be a fiduciary relationship. And the court said, well, no, there's not a fiduciary relationship. But what we're going to do is we're going to put the uh, put the change the burden of proof and flip it off to the defendant. Uh, in this case. So it, so even though there's not a fiduciary relationship, you will have um, the, the defendant will bear the burden of proof, which means that they have to come up with the documents on their own, essentially, to prove that they adequately accounted and correctly accounted. Bruce, any thoughts? Well, I certainly agree with Dorothy's statement that uh, it depends on which judge you're in front of, because I'll talk more about it 
in a second, but the parole evidence issues are huge. And uh, that's why I'm gonna talk about it uh, in profit participation cases and in just garden variety contract cases. Uh, in terms of whether it's more talent friendly or not, I think that depends too. Um, I've heard people say, if you're a plaintiff uh, uh, and you're talent in, in front of a jury, you're looking great, but it doesn't always work out that way these days. I thought it was interesting that we have a case currently before the LA Superior Court called Kirkman versus AMC, which is one of the uh, walking dead accounting cases. And here we have a uh, Los Angeles judge, Judge Buckley, who is uh, handling a uh, complex and very big money accounting action under New York law. And if you read his most recent decision, particularly about the implied covenant, it's interesting how similar uh, New York law is to California law. In fact, reading through that decision, it, it's hard to come up with any real substantive differences. But again, you know, the uh, temperament of the decision maker is often key in these things. Um, so, Bruce, with that, why don't we turn on to parole evidence and what circumstances uh, will we be able to get in information evidence before the uh, decision makers that aren't within the four corners of the contract? So here we go. I'm here to talk about the parole evidence. And the first question is, why are we talking about it? And the answer is because it's darn important in a profit participation case or a regular contract case. Maybe. Depends on what the contract says. Um, but if you do have uh, parole evidence, extrinsic evidence, which is uh, admissible, persuasive, and powerful, you're definitely going to have the upper hand at your trial, at your arbitration, and you're probably going to have the leverage at a mediation. And if you don't, you don't. So how does it work in California? Um, and, and, and probably all the listeners know this, but you go to CCP. Uh, California Code of Civil Procedures, Section 1856, and it sets forth the basic rule, but the basic rule is really important. If you're trying to introduce uh, parole, testimony, oral evidence, extrinsic evidence, which contradicts or varies your written agreement, you're out, doesn't get in. But if you're trying to explain or supplement an ambiguous agreement, it gets in. Um, the way it works in California, there's this two-step process. First step is that the court receives parole evidence provisionally, always. The court looks at it and then makes a decision. Is the written agreement reasonably susceptible to more than one interpretation? In other words, the plaintiff's interpretation and the defendant's interpretation. If the answer to that question is no, the court says it ain't getting in and the judge will decide, you know, interpret the written agreement as a matter of law. If the parole evidence, uh, I'm sorry, if the written agreement is deemed to be reasonably susceptible to more than one interpretation, then the parole evidence gets in and you would think, uh, well, it gets in, you have conflicting parole evidence, it goes to the jury to resolve the conflict, and you would then think that the court would then make the legal call of the uh, interpretation of the written agreement. And that's usually the case, but that's not always the case, at least according to the California Supreme Court, in a pretty famous case, City of Hope versus Genetech, and I'll give you the site, but at page 395, if the parole evidence gets in and it's in conflict, and in order to resolve the conflict, the jury has to weigh the credibility of the sides, of the witnesses, of the testimony, then the court is empowered to let the jury interpret the contract. Um, I don't think that most people focus on that. But that is indeed what the California Supreme Court said. So what is parole evidence and what isn't parole evidence? I, I kind of think of it as three species. Uh, uh, number one, you have oral conversations between the negotiators or the drafters of a contract. And those oral conversations, which usually take place, not always, but usually 
pre-contract signing are hugely important. And that is usually, usually legitimate parole evidence if you have a contract that's reasonably susceptible to more than one interpretation. And that evidence gets in. Level two is expert testimony on custom and practice or on trade usage. Um, and level three is what I would call course of performance testimony. So if post-contract in an accounting dispute, let's say, and I'll give you an example in a second, the parties account to each other in a particular way, that can become very powerful evidence that that's the right way to interpret the contract. Uh, so my example is a case, um, and this is a published decision. It's also a case that I mediated last month and it's called Brown versus Goldstein. And I'm not gonna talk about the mediation obviously, but I will talk about the published decision. It's an appellate court decision on of all things, the parole evidence rule. And um, uh, Brown versus Goldstein is about the, the banned war you know, why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? I can't sing. Um, they have a lot of iconic songs, the band war. Why can't we be friends? Low rider, spill the wine with Eric Burton. That's uh, not with the animals, by the way. Slipping into darkness, Cisco kid, the world is a ghetto. So they entered into a contract with their publisher, their music publisher slash manager in 1972. So the court's dealing with a contract that's dated 1972 is the main agreement. There were other agreements as well. I, I by the way, was a sophomore in high school in 1972. So it's a pretty long time ago. And they had three levels of um, parole evidence that got in. Well, let me back up. There were two contract provisions and they were fighting over whether the uh, publisher's share of performance, uh, public performance royalties was in the pot, in other words, should be included in gross receipts or was excluded from the pot, excluded from gross receipts. Paragraph seven kind of said, it's out. Paragraph 22 kind of said it's in. The trial court relying on paragraph seven said it's out, motion for summary granted, went up to the appellate court, the appellate court said, hey, let's hear about this parole evidence. So. There was testimony from the negotiators of the contract. And yes, they were still alive even in 2019 when this case was published, even though the contract was negotiated in 1972. The court looked at that. The court looked at the testimony um, from experts. What was the custom and practice at the time for songwriter splits on the publisher's share of um, public performance royalties? And then they looked, and this is important, that the publisher actually paid the disputed portion over um, the course of the contract. Not always, but sometimes, which is why there was parole evidence going both directions. The court concluded on this case that the contract was reasonably susceptible. And so this parole evidence was uh, received uh, and the summary judgment was reversed. And now it's going to go back to the trial court because we have parole evidence on both sides. You know, the appellate court only listened to parole evidence on one side. So what parole evidence is not, just for future reference, and this is my view, but I think it's the correct legal view, is if an expert gets up there and says, my understanding or my interpretation of paragraph five is X, no, not good parole evidence does not get into evidence. If the expert testifies, this is the custom and practice in the industry, and this is how they usually handle things like paragraph five, that probably gets into evidence. Another thing that does not get into evidence is unspoken subjective intent of the parties. So if you're taking a deposition and a witness gets up there and says, well, you know, I was reading the contract while we were negotiating, my interpretation of paragraph five was blank. Not good, doesn't get into evidence. But if the testimony is, I was reading the contract while we were negotiating and my interpretation of paragraph five was X and I told that to the other side when we were negotiating, that's proper parole evidence and that gets into evidence too. Now, that leads to another issue which I like to call room service testimony. I did not invent this term. I've stolen it from Judge uh, Meisinger who I work with. Um, so a lot of times, 
you'll be taking a deposition and witnesses will, especially when you're dealing with profit participation agreements or old agreements from way back when, you'll have a witness that doesn't remember anything. You remember anything about where you were when you negotiated this? No. You remember where you were when you negotiated paragraph one? Two, no. Paragraph three, no, I don't remember. Paragraph four, no, don't remember. Paragraph five, the one you're fighting about, all of a sudden, the witness has an incredible memory of everything that went down on paragraph five. We jokingly refer to that as room service testimony because it's like you dialed up room service to get the exact oral testimony you needed. Does that room service testimony get into evidence? Yes. Is it persuasive? Maybe not. Who knows? It depends on the context. One last point and then I'm done. Um, so back to this issue of who decides when, uh, who decides the case when there's disputed parole evidence? Does it go to the jury? Does it go to the judge? And who decides whether a case is reasonably susceptible or not? That is always, I'm sorry, reasonably susceptible to more than one interpretation. That is a judge call. And in federal court, there's actually Ninth Circuit authority that says the judge can make the call on a 12B6 motion and can rule that the contract is only susceptible to one interpretation, which basically shuts down all parole evidence. That's all I got. It's a very interesting area in California law because I think almost all contract cases turn on it. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Dorothy, could I um, ask you to what extent does the uh, explanation that Bruce has just given apply to New York? Uh, it's the same sort of consideration supply where you have an ambiguous uh, contract term? Yes. If the contract is ambiguous, the courts will let in parole evidence. You know, the, 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 the threshold question then is that is the provision ambiguous or clear and unambiguous? And that is generally for the court to decide. Hey, hey so, Dorothy. Yes. Um, I'm not sure of this, and I'm just asking. I get a sense that, generally speaking, it's a little more loosey-goosey in California than it is in New York about what's ambiguous and what's not, because I think a lot of trial judges, when in doubt, let it in. Right. I, I think that is not the case in New York. And I think this goes back to, to something I touched on in my initial talk. New York is a very strict business jurisdiction. They are inclined to only review the contract within the four corners of the document. And they are really loath unless you give them good reason to er overturn the language of the contract. And it's very rare for a judge to do that unless you can really convince them that there's an ambiguity. Now, every once in a while, I had a case years ago involving the Dixie Cups and the Shangri-Las. We were actually on the, the record company side. The contract was clear and unambiguous that we didn't have to pay royalties. But Judge Keenan, during oral argument, stopped me multiple times and said, I understand what you're saying, Ms. Weber, but do you think that's fair? <laughs> and that was such a shock to me because in New York, it doesn't matter if it's fair or not. It's what it says. <laughs> but Judge Keenan was having none of that and the case ultimately settled. But New York, New York judges are loath to let in parole evidence unless the contract is ambiguous. So, or, so, you know, or the usual other mix of if there was fraud or something, you know, some pointable fraud or mistake that you've alleged in the complaint. But as far so, as contract interpretation, if the court rules that it's clear and unambiguous, no parole evidence. And, and here in California, the seminal case of PG&E, the court yeah. explains at great length, it's California Supreme Court case, at great length that words are not as, as specific and as, as clear as the reader may believe they are, which is why, uh, which is why the, the courts here in California have to at least at provisionally, as, as Bruce said, they have to at least look at the parole evidence. And I think, you know, nine times out of 10, when courts look at the parole evidence, words that they think they understood, especially in the entertainment industry, where we speak in, in 
in tongues. <laughs> right. We have words that no one else really knows, and certainly courts don't really necessarily understand them. Um, so nine times out of 10 in a profit participation case, that parole evidence is coming in. And these days with, with uh, email and texts, uh, you know, the, the, the parole evidence is prolific. Right, right. One of the things that, that Bruce touched on that I think is right, even in New York, in older contracts where terms of art hadn't even fully developed, the courts are more inclined to lighten the restrictions on parole evidence. You know, I, I definitely think in recording contract cases where they're talking about things that technologies that hadn't been developed and things like that, the courts are definitely more inclined to, to listen to parole evidence. But again, not a, as Bruce pointed out, not necessarily expert parole evidence, but what the intent of the parties was. Because an expert standing on the outside looking in, the, the courts are not as inclined to, to listen to that. They want to know what the parties intended, even if it wasn't artfully expressed. Yeah, I was just going to throw in one other point. Having you know sat as a um, you know I, I I was a you know litigator, but now having sat as a mediator in, in several profit participation cases, you read these contracts, and sometimes you think it's really clear, um, and the parties see it differently, and it's almost like you're never going to make any progress. Somebody has to go make a motion for summary judgment. And um, because there has to be some kind of finality before everybody can, you know, make, make moves. And I got to say, sometimes I am pleasantly surprised that the summary judgment went the way I expected it to go. And sometimes I am astounded that, and I will say I did one where there were two key issues and I thought summary judgment was going to go uh, one way uh, for one side and the summary judgment will go to the other way for the other side, both as a matter of law. And the trial judge, I went over for two. You know, the trial judge just did it differently. And, and in some ways it doesn't even matter because once there's a resolution, then the um, uh, parties can solve it. But in profit participation cases, a lot of times the language is old. A lot of times it's, it's, it, it, it definitely requires experts or, or the negotiators or the, or the um, drafters to speak to it. And, and that's why parole evidence might be, might be key. It might not be, but it might be. Just could I ask you to perhaps give us a, a quick summary of the article we've included in the material about the Bones case with the importance of uh, uh, how the uh, escort uh, term was being applied in that case. Yeah, I mean, let me just put it to you this way. I think it's a super sensitive issue when it comes up in uh, me mediations uh, now. And, and I think uh, Ms. Johansson has uh, added to the sensitivity of the issue. Um, and um, I mean, that's really all I got right now. Um, we have a couple of questions, so I'm going to switch to questions now, unless anybody, does anybody have anything else they want to add to the general discussion? Oh, yes. Hi, Dorothy. So, so Bruce, one of the things that, that I, I struggle with um, in drafting a contract, and I think it's a question that all of us have struggled with, is, is it better to have mediation or litigation concerning these types of contractual issues? I, I honestly think that depends on who, who you represent. I think a lot of times the, the institutional side uh, of, the, of the field is, is pushing arbitration provisions, which I believe, I could be wrong, but I did read Scarlett Johansson's case against Disney. I just read the complaint and I was kind of wondering when I started to read it, why there wasn't a claim against Marvel for breach of contract. And then I go, oh, this is a way to avoid the arbitration provision. <laughs> and, and so as talent, uh, 
you probably want to be able to avoid the arbitration provision. The person you're negotiating with probably won't let you unless you have super leverage. I mean, a lot of entertainment contracts have arbitration provisions. <laughs> I personally am always a fan that you do mediation before arbitration or litigation, but um, I think it depends on who you represent. Bonnie, do you, do you feel differently on that? No, for the most part, I, I think that um, given the uncertainties in our court system and even in arbitration, uh, it's better to try to mediate first to see if you can't uh, put together a, a resolution that benefits both parties, which once you go to court and once you go to arbitration, a lot of times you can't. There's a winner and a loser, and that's that's usually not good for really for either side, because, because it generates bad feelings. And in this entertainment industry, which is a small industry, Absolutely. you know, having bad blood between talent and studio is not the best outcome. So if you can mediate and put many smart heads together to try to find a resolution that everybody's happy with, I think that is the best outcome. So I'm a big fan of mediation as well. Thanks for that. Okay, I'm going to turn now to a couple of questions we have. The first one is from Michael Kaiser, who asks, Bonnie, great 10-minute presentation. Um, under California law, to what extent may the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing be used to hold defendants liable for fiduciary-like breaches of wrongs uh, that may not violate the express terms of profit, particip profit participation agreements? but nevertheless frustrate the benefits thereof. I recognize, he says, under California law, outside of insurance bad faith, a breach of the covenant doesn't provide a basis for punies, but nevertheless, to what extent can such a claim be used to expand the scope of conduct that uh, defendants can be held liable for? Well, we use it a lot. That's, that's a very good question. And uh, Dorothy touched upon it in New York and certainly in California. We use the breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing a lot to try to get at situations where maybe the letter of the law was followed, but not the, uh, the letter of the contract may have been followed, but not the spirit that it was clearly not intended. And it really undermines the parties, um, what the parties have bargained for. So, uh, uh, while I don't think that a breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing is going to get you to a breach of fiduciary duty, it uh, so it's not going to get you tort damages, it certainly can help you in establishing the breach of contract damages um, that, that you're seeking. Yeah, I'll jump in on, on, on top of that answer by it. By Bonnie, I completely agree. That's a hundred percent. I mean, the implied covenant claim is a very valuable claim for the sides to use. I don't think it ever gets you to tort damages or breach of fiduciary duty damages, but it might get you something that's not in the contract. Um, the only thing I would add is that my understanding of the, of the cases out there is that if you have a contract that says um, you are entitled to do X. They can never assert a claim. Uh, they can never assert a breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing claim because you did X. If the contract expressly allows you to do X, I think you get a pass. I think there's cases that say that, but it's not always that clear. So the implied covenant claim comes in pretty so handy. So there is a case, speaking of that, Bruce, there's a case, um, uh, April Enterprises versus KTTV, Metro Media, in wow. which the contract itself was um, somewhat inconsistent. On the one hand, it said that, um, th that the parties can use these tapes. They were live tapes of the Paul Winchell show. They could use these tapes uh, to, for syndication, which is where the money was back then after network. Um, and, and there was another provision that said that either party after uh, six or nine months, I can't remember exactly the time period, 
could erase the tapes. And, and it expressly said you could erase the tapes after this period of time. And the part, one of the parties actually erased the tapes and the other party sued including a breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing, claiming that if you erase the tapes, how am I going to put this into syndication? Mm -hmm. And the court actually said, yeah, we're, you can't, that, you know, we're going to basically interpret the contract under the um, breach of covenant of good faith and fair dealing as saying you can erase the tapes, uh, but only if there's no chance that there's going to be syndication. So even though there was an express provision saying after such and such period of time, you could erase the tapes, the courts actually went the other way on that, which, which goes, it goes to show that it depends on what judge you have. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, I'm, I, I know the case and I'm a friend of, uh, I, I'm a, a fan of uh, Winchell Mahoney and Knuckle yeah. Smith and I remember <laughs> them. Um, and, and, and I remember that case. I think there's cases like, it's just all over the place sometimes it too. Is. So that's another reason the claim has value. As a litigation yeah. tool, that cause of action is really important. I think to get your client's story out too. You know, a breach of contract claim is a very dry read for, for a judge. If you're able to allege the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing, it really brings in what I always say is the sexy element that gets a court more interested in the underlying issues between the parties in the case, rather than just a dry reading of the language. I really, I find that the, it's a really, really important tool uh, in litigation to, to, if you have the ability to bring that cause of action in. And, and Alexander might know this, um, but you were, Alexander, you were talking about the Walking Dead case. My, my memory is of that recent ruling. One of the claims the judge allowed to go forward was a breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. And then one of the claims he didn't allow go forward was also a breach of the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. So um, I don't know. Do you recall that? Because I do not off the top of my head. Um, I don't re recall the specifics of which one, which claims he allowed to go forward and which ones he didn't. But, you know, he was taking, focusing very much on this one MAGA definition clause, which was left very much up to AMC to interpret. And the question was, if it was up to AMC to use their discretion to use a, you know, a fair um, formula, to what extent can you attack that with the breach of the implied covenant? And um, the feeling was that because that discretion had been given to them, um, they weren't breaching the implied covenant. Essentially, it was, it was a gift to them. I guess if they had done it in some massively unreasonable manner, it might be different. But, you know, he was taking the point of going, the contract expressly gives them that right. Mm -hmm. And then you come back to the question of going, well, what if they used it in a radically unfair way to discriminate? Mm -hmm. um, it's a really interesting. But, guys, we're, we're right up on 10.30 now. I'm sorry to the... Uh, the three questions pending that we haven't managed to get to, but as with all of these uh, um, programs, which go as well as we've gone today, we, we've run out of time. And I want to thank our three panelists very much indeed. I think it's been a great discussion. It's been very illuminating. I've certainly learned a lot. And um, I think we're at the close. So uh, thank you again to Nykla. Thank you, Beverly Hills Bar. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Alexander. You're very welcome. Thank you, Alexander. Thank and thanks you, to all the attendees as well. And I, really, Thank you. I really want to encourage the attendees, look at the materials, there's some great articles in there, and uh, we hope to see you on another program soon. And certainly, if anybody has questions uh, that didn't get answered and they want to email me, I'm happy to answer them. Right, I think all, all of us agree. Yeah. Okay, thank you all. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.